Welcome everyone to the sermon here at Laura Christian Church. We will again be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. The title of my sermon this week is God's Gifting. As I said last week, we didn't get to cover everything in this passage of scripture. Not that we're going to cover everything again this week, but I wanted to do it again to unpack um, the gift of singleness, which we didn't really look at last week. Um, so we're definitely going to look into that more this week. If you have the gift of singleness, what that looks like, what that may mean, and also kind of go over again what it means to be in a biblically more points on what it means to be married and what that looks like. But if you're able, will you please stand as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. I will be reading out of the NIV today because it is larger print without my glasses, as I said. But this is the word of the Lord. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. You may be seated. As I said, the title of this message is God's Gifting. God's Gifting. As you know, we will be looking at the principles of marriage and of singleness in chapter 7. And as I mentioned last week, in the part of the letter to the Corinthians, this part of the letter to the Corinthians church, Paul is answering questions. Questions that Corinthians had sent to Paul, as I mentioned last week again. Paul in chapter 16, this is probably where the questions came from. Paul mentioned in chapter 16 that a group of men that were with him at the time he wrote this letter had come from Corinth. Most likely, it was when this group came and visited him that they brought the questions and they also gave him a report on what was going on in Corinth. And it was probably what prompted the writing of this letter. And as you know, throughout this letter, Paul has been encouraging where the Corinthians needed to be encouraged. Paul has been correcting where the Corinthians need to be corrected. Paul has been rebuking where they needed to be rebuked, and so on and so on. But in all of it, Paul has always, and I will continue to say this, Paul has always had the cross of Christ in view, as any letter, any statement in the Bible always does, Old Testament and New. It has the cross of Christ in view. Again, the overarching theme of this letter and I hope you guys have this down. I will continue to say it if you don't. But what is the overarching theme of this letter? It's living under the lordship and authority of Christ, the head of his body, the church. Living under the lordship and authority of Christ, the head of his body, the church. This is the purpose for the writing of 1 Corinthians. And since that is the purpose, it is full full of practical things for us today. Just think about this. Just think about what we looked at last week. Paul got right down and talked about sexual intimacy within a marriage. And people say the Bible is not relevant for today. But it is. There are a couple things I would like to underline from last week that I didn't unpack and there were some questions in the men group, men's group on one. First, 
is the statement that I said that your marriage covenant to your spouse will not transfer to heaven. Will not transfer to heaven. I did not say where I got that from. I did not give a scripture reference to that. So I would like to do that really quick this morning. So please turn to Matthew 22. Please turn to Matthew 22. Again, we're looking at your marriage covenant will not be in heaven. And as you turn there, remember, ultimately, ultimately, marriage is a representation. Whether believers marry believers, believers marry unbelievers, or two unbelievers, it is a representation of Christ and his bride. But again, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. I will be reading verses 23 through 30. Matthew 22, 23 through 30. And we'll unpack it just a little bit. That same day, the Sadducees, who said there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if the man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, and this is their question, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus replied, You are in error, because you do not know the scripture or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, you have not read what God has said to you. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So they came to Jesus questioning, like, okay, we got another tr trick question for you. Said, if, okay, if you, this marriage thing is so important, let's talk about marriage, we'll get him with this. It's like, we have a woman that's married to a man, he dies. She goes all the way through the six other brothers, all get marriage legitimately because of deaths. Who's going to be the one she's married to in heaven? And Jesus said, you don't understand. Heaven's not going to be like that. There will be no marriage covenant in heaven. So that is one place we can go to to show that we will not be married in heaven. If you have been married and have had a spouse or more, you will not have that marriage covenant. Why? Because as I said last week, we are married to the bridegroom, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ himself. It's not going to be looked at. Just listen to Matthew 12, 46 and 49. It's even more than the marriage thing. He, as in Jesus, was still speaking to the crowd, and suddenly his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look. Your mothers and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak with you. But listen to Jesus' reply here. But he replied to the one who told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, There are my mother and my brothers. That was Matthew 12, 46-49. You see, Jesus is turning everything around. He did turn everything around. Listen, those that repent and believe in him are brought into an eternal family. And one day we will all be together again, all believers throughout all of history, and we will be the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Yes, earthly relationships are important, but they will fade away also. Listen to John Piper on this when he's speaking of these verses. 
He says, yes, he, Jesus, loved his mother and brothers. But those are natural and temporary relationships. He did not come into the world to focus on that. He came into the world to call people, call out a people for his name from all families of the earth into a new family where single people in Christ are full-fledged members and on par with each other. I will be not married. I will not be married to Jen in heaven. You all will be my brothers and sisters, but I will be not married to Jen. Constance Barnes will not be my mother in heaven. She will be my sister in Christ. Erwin Quook will not be my grandfather in heaven. He will be my brother in Christ. We will be one in Christ. We are his bride. Just read John 17 if you have time today. John 17, Jesus' prayer, it's all about oneness in him. We looked at it Wednesday night. So I hope that helps explain that a little bit. I'm glad somebody brought that up this Tuesday. So this even means, as we looked at last week, there's a lot that it means. But it even means, as I want to unpack the intimacy in marriage just a little bit more, that I, even our intimacy in marriage is a foretaste of that. A foretaste of that oneness that we will have in Christ. And we'll be looking at that for a little bit before we get to the singleness part of this verse, these, this passage we have before us. Just think of the book of the Song of Solomon that speaks of this truth. It is a beautiful book written about a bride and his wife, but ultimately is pointing to the intimacy we will have with Christ someday. And the ultimate meaning of marital sex is final delights between Christ and his bride. Listen to John Piper again. You don't have to be an ascetic. You don't have to be afraid of the goodness of physical pleasure to say that sexual intimacy and sexual climax get their final meaning from what they point to. What they point to. They point to the ecstasies that are unattainable and inconceivable in this life. Just as the heavens are telling the glory of God's power and beauty, so is sexual climax is telling the glory of immeasurable delights that we will have in Christ in the age to come. There will be no marriage there, but what marriage meant will be there, and the pleasures of marriage Ten to the millionth power will be there. It's all pointing to him. It's all pointing to when we're going to be with him someday. That's the beauty of our passage. What did Paul say? It's the beauty of this. In verses 3 to 5, he said, A husband should fulfill his marital responsibilities to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. We just looked at this. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. What is that? That's mutual submission. What does that mutual submission lead to? The best possible sexual intimacy. And what does that point to? Our intimacy with Christ someday. And it's going to be joy, unspeakable, overwhelming. And then this happens... We will not only see happier, joyful, more marriages, but they will be God-honoring marriages. If those verses are lived out properly, just think of the human possibility which they would represent of Christ and his bride. Our marriages would be a city on a hill, not a blemish upon the church, unfortunately, as they have become. Listen to one other com author's comment on these verses. But really, we need to see Paul's commands in verses 3 through 5 in view of these mutual rights. Mutual rights. He does not say, therefore, state your claim. Take your rights. He says, husbands, 
give her rights that belong to her. Wife, give him the rights that belong to him. In other words, he does not encourage the husband or the wife who wants sexual gratification to see without concern, to go for it, look for it, without concern for the other's needs. Instead, he urges both the husband and the wife to always be ready to give his or her body when the other wants it. Again, it's all about submission. Why am I bringing this up again? What is it ultimately about? It's ultimately about submission to the Lordship of Christ. What is this letter all about? Living under the Lordship and authority of Christ, the head of the church. Again, that's just kind of a footnote for last week. Well, what about those that are single? Single, Or what about those who are widowed? Should everyone get married? That's what, remember, a lot within the Corinthian church were saying no one should get married because that physical stuff is just all bad. I hope we have shown that that is not true. All of that points to Christ and the beauty and the pure joy and ecstasy we will have when we meet him someday. But not everyone should be married. Not everyone should be married. What did Paul say? Paul agreed with the Corinthians at the beginning of this chapter when he comments on that statement. When he comments on that statement, what did he say? He said, it is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. Paul does not agree with that thought. He says it's good for a person never to have sexual intimacy. Good. It is a good thing. But if that's not what your calling is, as we will look at here shortly, that is not where you should be. If you have a desire for sexual intimacy, you should get married. You should get married within the confines of marriage and work that out. But look at the end of our passage today in verse 6. This is Paul's wish. Notice this is his wish. What does Paul say? I say the following as a concession, not a command. This is not a command. He says, I wish that all people were just like me. So Paul is wishing that all people were just like him. But how does he follow that up? Because it's not a command. He says this. But each has his own gift from God. One person in this way and another in that way. Paul wished that all believers were just like him. Single. He wanted all believers to be single. That was his wish. Why? Why? What was Paul doing without the burden of a wife? And I do not use the word burden in a bad sense. What is Paul able to do without the responsibility of being a husband? Whether he was married at one point or not, that is debated, that really doesn't matter. At this point in his life, he was not married. What is he able to do? What does he not have to worry about again? He doesn't have to worry about providing for a family or a wife. He doesn't have to worry about protecting. What has that allowed him to do? It's allowed him to go and proclaim the gospel unhindered. It's allowed him to go and proclaim the gospel unhindered. And he wishes that all believers were as free as he in this, to be able to do this. Paul was free to serve Christ without the responsibility of caring for another within the covenant relationship of marriage. He was free to serve Christ without the responsibility, not that it's a bad responsibility, it's a good thing. Ministry of marriage is a beautiful thing. We've talked about that last week and some this week. But he was free to serve Christ without the responsibility of caring for another within the covenant of a marriage relationship. His ministry would have been different. Possibly, if he was married. <coughs> That's not the way God planned it. 
That's not the way God ordained it, so that's not the way it should work, they worked out. So as I said, who should get married and who should remain single? Paul answers this question. Paul answers this question. What is your gifting, as the title of my sermon says? Do you have the gift of singleness? You have to answer that for yourselves. This passage says, do you have desires that you cannot control? Do you have a desire, ladies, to be a family? Have a family. I know I'm speaking to ones that have already gone through that today, but tomorrow there will be others. There are some young ones here. Do you have desires to have a family? If you have those desires, you should get married. Do you have desires to be with one person intimately? In the covenant of marriage, you should get married. It is the gift of singleness. Notice it says that it is the gift of singleness, not that if you are single. If you are single, doesn't mean you have that gift. Also notice it is a gift. It is a gift from God. God is the one that gifts a person. And again, if you do not have that gift, you should get married. But what did Jesus, Jesus said this. He's, when speaking of a gift in John chapter nine or Matthew chapter nineteen, when he was talking about divorce and marriage, and we're going to be looking at that more next week when we talk about divorce and marriage. But for now, I'd just like to point out to John or Matthew chapter nineteen. Excuse me, Matthew chapter nineteen, that Jesus said this, and he's talking about divorce and marriage. In verse ten, the disciples said this to Jesus, based on what he just said about marriage and divorce. It hit him pretty hard. So they said, if the relationship of a man and his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. Again, we'll look more into that next week. But basically, Jesus got done unpacking. One man, one woman, death do you part. His disciples said, this is pretty hot. This is pretty deep. This is pretty good. I'm not sure we can handle that. Maybe we shouldn't get married at all. That's what his disciples were saying. What did Jesus say to that? He said, not everyone can accept this saying. The saying of, don't get married. But, only those who has been given to you. Again, singleness, the gift of singleness, is from God alone. If you don't have that gift, God wants you to get married. A person that is in their 30s, 40s, or older, and still has a desire to be married and have a family, they do not have the gift of singleness. If that desire overwhelms you. If it overwhelms you. But some do. Some do have that gift. I thought of a couple just off the top of my head when I was writing this. I thought of Amy Carmichael. Carmichael. I thought of Corey Tinboom. And others that came to mind. And I found some other quotes as I studied for this. Listen to Rihanna Taylor as she said this. She's a single missionary in Kenya who wrote this. She said, Being single has meant that I am free to take risks that I might not take if I were a mother of a family that was dependent on me. Being single has given me the freedom to move around the world without having to pack up a household first. And this freedom has brought me to moments that I would not trade for anything this side of eternity. She is a person that understands the gift of her singleness. Listen to Trevor Douglas when he talks about his gift. The first advantage is that it is best to adapt. It is best adapted to perilous situations. In the rugged life among the primitive tribes, in gorilla infested areas, or in disease and famine, a single man has only himself to worry about. Paul claims that being single and male best fits the shortness of the time of doing God's work and this momentary is a momentary thing. Advantages and opportunities come and go very quickly. The single lifestyle enables one to get the most out of the time God gives for his work. 
One of my chief delights is that I don't have to fit my ministry around a family schedule. I don't have to be home at a certain time each night. My time is Filipino time, he says. Douglas quotes one of his heroes, humanly speaking, in his quote. This is a quote from a missionary named David Bernard, who said this, I care not where or how I live or what hardships I went through so that I could not but gain souls for Christ. While I was asleep, I dreamed of these things. And when I awoke, the first thing that thought was that comes to mind was this great work. All my desire was for the conversion of the heathen, and all my hope was in Christ. Those are pretty extreme statements by single missionaries in the field. If you have the gift of singleness, that doesn't mean you need to be a single missionary in the field. And some might be saying, oh man, if I'm single, I'm supposed to be doing that? No. I want to end with another quote. Not end, but tell you another quote. I think of a very wise lady that who did have the gift of singleness. There needs to be a balance here. This is, in, this is her response. She does not give her name in the book I read these quotes from. But this is her response to David Douglas's quote. The one that just said everything he thought about was going out but proclaiming Christ and wasn't hindered because he was single. But listen to what she says. I think this is very wise, very wise from her. She says, I believe that singles have the flexibility in scheduling, but they are not totally free from anxiety. While I'm happy to be free from balancing a husband and family needs and ministry, I must face other practical needs. If Jesus should tarry, retirement, housing, finances, etc. She also says the reality is that single women have to plan for future as singles. We must be good stewards with the resources we have. In ministry, she says, earns less than in the secular world. But if the choice, but it's a choice that has been made. But it does not mean I do not feel the tension. She says, how do singles balance a career that requires more than 40 hours a week, plus other outside commitments, with the extraordinary opportunity for single-minded investments in ministry? She says, pertaining to the book I got these quotes from, that I think there will be singles who interpret this to mean because they are not married, they are expected to devote every non-working hour to ministry. No. That's what she says, no. Is that expected of those that are married within ministry? Is that expected of those within the church to devote every waking hour to ministry? No. But she also says, unfortunately, there are many within the church who reinforce this error in their thinking. This can be turned into an abusive situation. Singles can be guilted and shamed into doing too much. I believe there must be caution to singles not to be overcome, over-invested. Singles must protect their spiritual, physical, and emotional health, as well as those who are married. Singles need to be affirmed to take time to develop nourishing relationships. Family, she says, within the body of Christ. I think that it's very well said. You may have the gift of singleness, which allows you to do ministry, unlike those that are married. Gives you opportunities, either flexibility in schedule and other things. But that doesn't mean you do it all, if you have that gift. Again, it is a gift. But singles do, and are able to devote more time to ministry. And it may be the ministry of prayer. I know I've had my, some of my best prayer seasons of life has been when I've been away from my family. 
as a season. That doesn't mean I'm getting rid of my family. <laughs> but we have those who are either widowed or single in this church that I know that are prayer warriors. They don't have the distractions. They don't have the distractions. Not that the distractions are bad. It's just what season of life have God called you in? Are you have the gift of singleness right now? And that doesn't mean he'll keep you in that gift the rest of your life. Either way, either. I thought of Nancy Lee DeMoss. She was 57 years old in her first marriage. 57. She wasn't looking to get married either. God just brought it happen. I don't, I don't get the impression that Nancy Lee DeMoss was dating her whole life trying to find a husband. That's not what she was doing. I think she truly believed, and she did have the gift of singleness until she was 57. But God chose when she was 57 to give her a husband. So he can change it. He can change it. What does it come down to? It comes down to this. Those who are unmarried and widowed can serve God in a different capacity than those who are married and who have children and or who have children living at home. It's just a different capacity. It's all one body. That's what Paul's saying. He's like, I wish you could be like me. If you have that gift of singleness, I would say don't fight it. Use it. If you don't, don't fight it. Use it in your marriages. God honoring marriages. This is what, what does Paul say in verses 8 to 9 when he's answering another question. Probably question number 2. He says, I say this to the unmarried and to the widows. It is good for them to remain as they are, as I am. But, if you do not have self-control, you don't have the gift, that is God-given gift, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with desire. And notice that it says, burn with desire doesn't say you don't have thoughts about being married if you're single. It says if you are burning with a desire, you do not have the gift. It's a burning. And if you have that burning desire, pursue marriage. Pursue marriage. Just because you're older, if you still have those burning desires, you should be pursuing marriage. But notice also, Paul says, if you are burning with desire, Paul does not mention, it'll put you in a better financial situation if you get married. He doesn't talk about physical things. He's talking about, yes, physical desires, but he's not saying, oh, I need to get remarried, I'll be better off financially. No. I think that lady that's let me be named unnamed said it well. Yes, you will have struggles as a single, especially if you're in ministry, because ministry normally doesn't pay as well, but God will provide. God will provide. The reason, if you want to get remarried, if you've lost your spouse because of financial reasons, that is not what this is saying here. Not what this is saying here. He also doesn't say, I just want a companion. No, that's what the body of Christ is for. He's taught, he says, it is better to marry than to burn with desires. To be burned with desires. And those that don't get married, that have those desires. If you have those desires and you choose not to get married, that is not where you want to be. Church history has taught us this. There are dangers for those who do not have the gift and should try to live a celibate life. Dangers. You know this. We have seen this play out in our lifetime. Not to pick on any, the church, but just think of the Catholic Church. What has happened? When they try to force singleness on those who do not have the gift of singleness. In other places, 
within the body of Christ. If you don't have that gift, you don't have that gift. Again, this is nothing new. Paul warns us here, and that was written about 2,000 years ago. I want to read what Calvin dealt with. And this was about 500 years ago. If you don't have that gift, it can be a very dangerous thing. You say, oh, I can live for Christ this celibate life. I can just deny those desires. No. Listen to Calvin. At the same time, the ancients erred, even in their esteem of virginity. For they extol it as if it were the most excellent of all virtues, and wish it to be regarded as the worship of God. Even in, there, even in this there is a dangerous error, and now follows another, that, after celibacy has begun to be so much esteemed, many vying with each other really vow perpetual consistency. That means stop doing it. They vowed they weren't going to do it. While scarcely a hundredth part of them were endowed with the power and the gift. So people, he's saying, have vowed to be celibate without the gift. Hence, too, a third sprang up. That is, ministers of the church were forbidden to enter marriage as a kind of life unbecoming the holiness of their order. And for those who, despising marriage, rashly vowed perpetual contingency, as in they were they were going to remain celibate, God punished their presumptions, first by secret flames of lust, and then afterwards by horrible acts of filthiness. The ministers of the churches being prohibited from lawful marriage, the consequence of this tyranny was that the church was robbed of very good and faithful ministers. Why does he say that? He says, For pious, godly, and prudent, wise men would not ensnare themselves in this way. At length, after a long course of time, lust, which had previously kept, been previously kept under, gave forth to the abominable odor. What is Calvin saying? He said, That has been forced. And in his time, and in our time, on people, the gifts of singleness, who do not have that gift. And what ultimately happens, they cannot control their desires within the confines of a godly marriage covenant. And Calvin also said, many a godly and wise men said, I'm not going to become a minister or a pastor, even though they may have that desire, because I know I need to be married with my desires. Singleness has been forced upon the church by some throughout history and today. And that's what Paul is saying in this passage. He's like, I wish you were already, but if you're not, if you're not, don't force it. Don't force it. If you're burning with desires, ladies, young ladies, my own and Michaela, if you have a desire to have a family, find a godly husband that your dad approves of, and get married. If you think you have the gift of singleness, God will work that out too. Let God work it out. Don't force it upon yourself. Don't force it upon yourself. He knows best, and He is the one that has chosen it for you. He is the one that has chosen for you, either the gift of marriage or the gift of singleness. Father God, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, I pray that your words are understood. Lord, I know there is... Lord, just do what you do. Lord, I thank you for pointing out in your word that it is the gift of marriage and the gift of singleness is from you. I pray that you help us all recognize those that, especially the young ones that we have here today, if they have the gift of singleness, that you will make that clear to them. Lord, if they don't have the gift of singleness, prepare them for marriage. 
Prepare them for marriage either way. I pray that you would prepare all of our young ones in this congregation for marriage. That is what we are supposed to do as parents raising up our children is prepare them for marriage. Help us to show them what it's about. And if you do give them that gift, they will be all the wiser with using their gift of singleness if they have the gift of singleness, knowing what a marriage should look like. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time as we get the chance to sing a couple hymns to you and praise you and worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen.